Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for that uh, very kind introduction. Thank you, Barry, uh, Governor Dukakis, for North Northeastern, uh, for hosting this great event. It's, uh, it's great to be here tonight. Good evening. Um, I'm excited to be a part of this panel. I'm excited for this discussion. I'm excited for the Q&A. I've heard that there's a really a good Q&A that always goes along with this, so I'm excited for some, uh, some good questions. Um, just really quickly, uh, just to tie off of what uh, Senator Chang has talked about, I have been working in the legislature for the last nine years on healthcare issues, and that may be unbelievable to some of you looking at how young I look, um, <laughs> but I actually started in state government when I was 15 years old, so. <laughs> um, I, I have to give a disclaimer whenever I, I kind of do presentations because I've always worked for uh, a, uh, an elected official. And so uh, my disclaimer is that uh, the thoughts and views that I present here today are my own, um, unless you think that they're very insightful, in which case you can assign them to my bosses. Um, but I guess uh, I'll just to dive in and to start to talk about this. I wanted to kind of set the stage for the discussion that we're gonna have today um, and talk about, you know, no, There's a keyboard. Just use the arrow. Got it. All right, yeah, PowerPoint, sorry. Um, just to set the stage on uh, this discussion about where healthcare costs are going, why is it a problem, and what is it that we here in Massachusetts are proposing to try to do about it? Um, all right, here we go. So I think it's important to start off by talking about who pays for healthcare. <laughs> And I think we all understand uh, that we pay for healthcare in our co-pays, in our deductibles, in the premiums that are withheld from our paycheck. But really, that's just a small portion of the total pie of who's paying for healthcare in this country. And I think the important graph here is, is on 2010. Um, and you can see that uh, household, which is the red, um, oops, all right. Um, all right. Uh, household, which is the red, private businesses, government, all of these different entities pay a large portion of what we uh, think of as healthcare costs generally in this country. And the way that we feel those costs is sometimes diffuse. Um, we can feel it directly in households, um, but what we don't understand is that our taxes go to pay for state and local governments and for their portion of what healthcare costs are. And that for private businesses, when they're making decisions about wages, and about salary, sometimes they're weighing those decisions against what are the rising costs in healthcare. So whether we realize it or not and kind of directly pay for it, rising healthcare costs touch us um, in a variety of different ways. And I wanna just kind of continue to return to this point um, about who pays for healthcare. Um, so where are we going in this state or in this country? Um, and where are healthcare costs going? I think probably you talked a little bit about this last week. Uh, nowhere good. Um, this is the projection and you can see uh, it really kind of takes off um, starting in 2009. Uh, this is a per capita uh, presentation, so $2,000 back in 1990, over $8,000 now, uh, $14,000 per person annually spent on healthcare in this country. Um, what does that mean as far as how other things are growing? Um, and what we find is that uh, the overall economy is actually growing at a much slower pace than what healthcare costs are growing. Historically, healthcare costs grow at two to three percent faster than the entire economy. So what we find is that more and more over time, healthcare is eating up a larger proportion of our GDP, our economic growth in this country. And it's projected to double uh, between now and 2034 um, as a percentage of our, our, our GDP as a country. Um, so we pay a lot for it and it's growing really fast. Um, and, but that may not be a problem because healthcare is just expensive and maybe we're getting a good deal for it. Um, that may or may not be the case. Uh, this is us compared to other uh, industrialized countries, uh, both on how much we pay for healthcare and how fast that is growing. Now, rising healthcare costs are absolutely an international problem. Every single developed country is, is wrestling and dealing with this issue. Um, but we in the United States, because we pay so much more, and because it is actually growing a little bit faster than the other developed countries, um, we have a serious uh, issue that we need to address. Um, which again might be fine if we were getting the best healthcare in the world, um, and this uh, indecipherable chart um, is basically talking about uh, preventable mortality rates. Um, we're kind of United States in between Chile and Portugal there. Um, 
Not the greatest. And, and I think as far as outcomes are concerned in this country, it would be a hard to make an argument that we have the very best and most efficient healthcare system um, in the world. Um, so what does that mean as far as the federal government? And what does it mean for the president as he wrestles with this issue? And this is the slide that I would show uh, the president um, in, as far as saying, this is why healthcare costs are really important for you to deal with as a federal government um, for the next uh, four year term. Um, so this chart uh, looks at spending in the federal government overall, and the dotted line is projected revenues. And anything above the dotted line um, is essentially deficit spending. So in this election, we hear a lot about federal deficit and the exploding deficit in the federal government. Um, but what that conversation is really about, but no one wants to talk about, is about health care. And it's about the rising cost of health care that's growing faster than just about everything else. It's growing faster than the revenues we collect, and it's growing faster than the economy. And so you can talk about defense spending, and you can talk about food stamps, and you can talk about Big Bird, but unless you're talking about health care, you're not really talking about what the long-term challenge that this country is facing. So now let me talk about the story here in Massachusetts. We have the same challenge. Uh, this is our projected total uh, health care expenditures in Massachusetts. Right now, we spend $68 billion on health care in Massachusetts. That's expected to double by 2020. Um, so we have the same trend line as the national as far as growth. Uh, but we actually have a more acute problem here in Massachusetts because uh, we spend more than any other state in health care on a per capita basis. That's us at the very far right uh, in the red bar. That's Massachusetts. And so in the most expensive country in the world that to pay for health care, we are uh, just about the most expensive state uh, for health care. And that's even adjusting for wages and for the fact that we do have a high cost of living here. Even adjusting for those things, health care costs in Massachusetts are about 15% greater uh, than the average. So what does that mean for Massachusetts and what we've had, what choices we've had to make? And coming back to that, who pays for health care? And so this is uh, for the state budget. Um, you can see that the growth um, in the percentage that we spend in our state budget every single year on health care just continues to go <laughs> up and up and up. It was 23% in 2000. It's 41% of our state budget today is going to health care. And by 2020, that's going to be 50% of our state budget going to <laughs> What does that mean? That means that we have less money to spend in public health, in mental health, in education, in transportation, all the other places that we as a society understand that government needs to play a role and make investments for our future um, are being constrained by the fact uh, that our health care costs continue to go up and up and up. Um, at the same time, again, going back to the who pays, um, there's an impact on workers. And what we have, this is just a chart that talks about healthcare cost growth in the bar, and then the line is wages. And what we find is that wages are stagnant here in Massachusetts, and healthcare costs continue to go up. And I talked to um, a healthcare provider just this week. He, he runs uh, a, a hospital, and he has a lot of um, low income and middle income workers that he work at his particular hospital. And he'd like to be able to pay more for those specific workers, but every year there comes the budget time, and they look at the budget and they say, this is how much we're gonna have to pay for health insurance for our employees. And this is how much is left over to be able to give in wages. And he's not able to give those wages out. So even though we don't even realize it, uh, this healthcare cost is pushing down and down on the ability for all of us to be able to make investments um, in our future. Um, thankfully, um, we live in a state where we tackle these problems and we address these problems right on. And um, the slide got a little messed up, but basically um, here in Massachusetts and especially in healthcare policy, we have a long history of, of dealing with difficult issues and, and taking them on front on, working with stakeholders, working with hospitals, working with physicians um, to try to address some of our problems. And I should have even gone back into the 80s here because there's a lot of reforms uh, that Governor Dukakis uh, spearheaded in healthcare policy. Um, I think the most important, obviously, and, and the one that we uh, spent a lot of time talking about is Chapter 58 um, in 2006. Um, this was, again, our access uh, law in Massachusetts where the, we are the first and kind of only state to deal with uh, the uninsured population. 400,000 uh, newly insured people here in Massachusetts because of that law. Um, it became the model for the national health care reform. Um, but even as we were doing that law, and I think it was Senator Cheney has mentioned it earlier, uh, we knew uh, that we had to deal with costs. Because if we didn't deal with all of those trends that I just showed you, 
uh, then this reform would not be sustainable. And the promise of having truly affordable health care for all of our citizens would be something that would be lost over time. And so uh, right away, even in uh, 2008, we passed significant legislation enhancing the transparency of health care costs, having an annual examination about what goes into health care costs, um, expanding uh, electronic health records in this commonwealth, um, understanding that that is a foundational element uh, for cost containment. In 2010, we again passed legislation, um, and we call them chapters. It's just the way we, it's like the nickname for legislation. So um, it's just the title for when they were passed. So chapter uh, 305, chapter 288, um, and, but all of this was kind of leading in Massachusetts and, and on Beacon Hill and in the healthcare world um, to try to say, how do we change the course for this entire commonwealth when it comes to healthcare? How can we change all of these trends and be able to uh, make the investments in the future that we know we need to make? And all of that led to a bill that we passed on uh, basically midnight of July 31st um, this last year. It's been in place for uh, two months. Um, and it goes into effect on um, uh, November 5th, which is next Monday. Uh, I'm working right now in the governor's office to help uh, to implement uh, this significant piece of legislation. Um, so what does this law do? Um, I think the most important thing that this law does, it says, let's set a goal for the Commonwealth. Let's take all of the healthcare that we're spending and let's set a goal to change that trend line and to make it something that can actually be sustainable for the long run. And so it sets a very aggressive goal. It sets a goal that for the first five years, uh, healthcare costs should grow at the same rate as the state's economy, um, our state's GSP. Um, so that's two to 3% per uh, year lower than what it had been in the past. And then after that five years, it says, we know that there's even more efficiency in the system. So we think we can actually bring that number down even lower than what the state's economy is growing at. So it goes to minus 0.5. And then after that, in 2023, I'll be working someplace else, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but no state in the country has tried to set a goal like this. And to set a goal um, that's this aggressive um, uh, is something where uh, this legislation and, and will be the work of the Commonwealth, I think, for the next five, 10 years is to make sure that we meet this goal. Um, so I think it's important to understand with this legislation that we set the broad goal as government and we have some accountability towards that goal. But we don't necessarily in the law say, this is the way you have to do it. Um, we expect, and the law actually envisions, that healthcare providers, health plans, healthcare consumers, very importantly, will be at the front, uh, front lines in demanding some of these changes <laughs> that we know can save money and improve quality. Uh, so this isn't a government coming in and saying, this is the way it has to be done. We'll set a goal and we'll help you, um, but the innovation has to come from the industry itself. It has to come from the physicians. They have to be bought into this. So what are some of the strategies that the bill kind of envisions as far as to help us meet this goal? Um, first, and I think we'll probably talk a little bit more about this, is um, reform of the payment system. Uh, right now, the payment system in Massachusetts and across the United States is a fee-for-service payment system. You get paid for every visit you have for every procedure you order, for every prescription that you write, um, for everyone who walks through your door, you get paid. It doesn't matter if they're healthy, it doesn't matter if they end up in the hospital the next day, that's how you get paid. This uh, strategy envisions changing that payment structure and saying you get paid if you keep your uh, patients well. Uh, and if you keep your patients healthy, if you keep your patients out of the hospital, that's how we're gonna give you an incentive. So changing fundamentally some of the underlying incentives in healthcare uh, to reward providers for doing their job well, for doing the job that they went to school and trained to do, um, and to be able to uh, remove this, this incentive to just do more care. Because we actually know that doing more care actually causes harm to the patients in a lot of cases. Um, some other uh, quick strategies, um, uh, investment in prevention and wellness. Uh, we absolutely know, and, and Senator Chang Diaz was a huge supporter and leader uh, for having this be a center, centerpiece of the bill. Um, we know that if we invest in keeping someone um, from ever developing diabetes or ever, ever developing a, a, a heart condition, um, that we can save so much money on the back end. It's not just about managing them when they do get that chronic disease. There are there ways that we can help them on the front end? Smoking cessation, asthma, obesity. We know that if we make small investments in these things, the return on investment is tenfold. Um, so, 
this bill envisions a more significant investment in public health than uh, in probably the history of Massachusetts. Um, um, some other things, support of the primary care workforce, understanding that primary care needs to be a foundational element, uh, that the primary care doctor is, is the hub for this. Um, more support for a truly interoperable electronic health record system in Massachusetts. It's not enough to go to your doctor and have them be able to have an electronic record. That record needs to be able to speak to the provider down the street. Um, and that's where you get the savings, and that's where you can actually, um, one, uh, prevent uh, you know, complications that don't need to happen and prevent tests that don't need to happen. Um, but getting people to creating the links between these electronic systems is the real hard part of this bill. Uh, put some resources to actually making that a possibility. Um, and then just one other thing I'll, I'll mention, uh, uh, kind of a key strategy here, is providing consumers with new information. Uh, consumers, you know, it's so difficult, and healthcare is not like any other industry in the world when it comes to how do I make my purchasing decision, whether it's for a health plan or for a provider, how do I make decisions about where I need to go? And the, the, what happens is that you end up just getting a bill at the end of the day. And you don't even know what that bill was covering, what services it was, and you had no idea what this bill was trying to do. So this law um, actually gives some new tools to consumers that at the front end, you can for the first time be able to know, um, if I go to this provider, how much is it going to cost me out of pocket? Not an average person, but me particularly, David Seltz, with my co-pays and my deductibles for my specific health plan. If I go to this person, how much is it gonna cost? And so I don't end up afterwards getting a sticker shock of something that's 10, times more than what I was expecting because my doctor referred me to go there and I didn't know. So new tools for consumers to actually engage with quality and cost data, they need to be on the front lines of this. So um, what if, if we're successful in meeting this goal, what will that mean? Um, again, we, I've shown you this trend line a few different times. Uh, the blue is now that trend line with if we meet our goals in this uh, reform. Um, uh, here it is again as a, a percentage of, of our GDP. If we do nothing, this is the red line, it continues to grow and grow. If we're successful in this law and meeting the goals we've set, you can actually see it, it stays stable over time. Um, so what is that? There's a delta there at the end, right, between the red and the blue. Um, so what is that actually, what does that mean? Uh, that means $200 billion in savings over 15 years in Massachusetts. Billion. That means $13 billion more for take-home pay for employees here in Massachusetts. It means $40 billion um, in family premiums that would have gone up if this bill had not passed. And $38 billion in the public sector that we can reinvest in education and transportation. Um, that's if we're successful. Um, and that's a big if. Um, and it's a big challenge for Massachusetts. Um, and I'm excited to work on it. I'm excited to talk more specifically about some of the strategies. Um, and I'm happy to be here. So thank you.